Why is the Tristan team, right? Tristan and company, why is that an attractive place to work at? Why? Is this a dead end job? Is this an entry level job that no one wants to stay in? Or, or, or is this part of a bigger plan? Is this part of a bigger team that's going to accomplish something awesome, right? <laughs> Gus, you're in Mexico today. What part of Mexico? Uh, Michoacan State. So outside of Mexico City, outside of the mega, megalopolis that is Mexico City. So a couple hours towards the nice. beach. Dude, that's that's heading towards Ixtapa Resort. Have you ever I heard like of it? Ixtapa, uh, north of Acapulco. So I'll go up the highway from Acapulco. You're going to hit Ixtapa. Then, then a couple hours inland, like three hours inland, you hit me. Like, hey, how's it going? How far are you from Guadalajara? About four hours south of Guadalajara. Yeah. So, wow. Oh, so, right? Kinda, it's that, in that part of the country where it's kind of hard to tell you where it's like between Mexico City and Guadalajara, in the, like between both of those. I'm right in between both of those. I like that. I like that. Well, uh, besides geography, we're going to be talking about ISAs. So. <laughs> Exactly. exactly. <laughs> there you go. Today, the specific title that, that Gus and I just came up with and reduced well, <coughs> was How to Recruit an Experienced ISA. And I have to get some water, Gus, because I'm going to choke to death. But Gus, tell us <laughs> yeah. about hiring an experienced ISA. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, folks, uh, uh, thanks for jumping in uh, for this webinar today. Uh, if you're interested in the role inside sales agent, well, you came to the right place, right? Because we're talking about recruiting ISAs. I have a team of about 120 folks strong as of this morning. Uh, you know, maybe there'll be more by the end of the day. I don't know, right? We recruit every day. Uh, and we've hired, we hire folks every single day, every single week. We have training classes. So we do talk to a lot of candidates who are in the industry. I talk to, we have clients all over the U.S. and Canada. So we go through this process a lot. Uh, so you came to the right place. And one of the biggest challenges, I think, with folks uh, when they want to bring on an ISA is they, they desire someone with experience, right? And that's pretty much one of the hardest things to do in this role, the ISA role. Tristan, you've gone through a lot of folks in this ISA role. Most people, when they do it, they start with someone that this is the first time they've ever been an ISA. That is, I'd say 90% of the time, you're introducing someone, maybe to real estate, but at least into the ISA role. Would you say that's a pretty common thing, Tristan? Dude, yes, definitely, definitely. And, and if you're going to try to hire them on your own, there are a lot of hurdles in there. I've tried it. And that's why, that's why I gravitated to a company like yours, because it's just, you, you do all that recruiting, training for me. And if for any reason the person leaves, you have a backup for me. So that. That's what's made it easy for me, but let's talk about recruiting when you, when you don't have a company, like, what does that look like? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, when you've got a company and when you've got people coming, you know, when you have a team, you've got buyers, agents, assistants, I think the recruiting and hiring process kind of gets baked into what you do every day, right? It gets baked into what you have, it's part of your responsibility. When you have a smaller team though, the hiring and the recruiting can be a challenge. It's daunting, Tristan. One thing I'd say that distinguishes like the mega agents, the very successful agents who want to take off is that they understand that hiring and training people is a skill that they need to master along with selling real estate. Like it's right there, right? And probably one of the key pieces of your success is going to be your ability to attract, hire, retain really, really good people. So this is, I think this is part of that skill set. Um, and we're, we're, we're making it really specific to the ISA role and, and an experienced ISA, but that's a skill set you got to figure out, guys. If, you, if you're going to grow more than the solo, and if you're happy being a solo agent, that's great. You're probably not on this webinar, right? That's not the reason you're here. You want to stay a solo agent. You want to grow a team. You want to add some leverage. Adding leverage in the lead generation, lead conversion part of your business is one of those recipes to grow. If you've got people helping you generate more leads, people helping you convert those leads when they come in, you're going to need teammates, right? You're going to need more people on that team because the pie is going to get bigger, right? Bigger, bigger, bigger. But let's start, let's start from the top, right? What do we even mean by experienced ISA? What does that even mean, Gus? What? I've never had an experienced ISA. I've always talked to newbies 
people that are new to the industry, people that are new to the role. Well, I'm going to tell you about this. Um, I talk to a lot of folks, a lot of candidates all day, every day, and getting people, even people in the ISA role with specific real estate experience is really, really challenging. It happens, but it's very, very rare because in the call center industry, it's dominated by tech support, customer support, um, you know, troubleshooting. That's 99% of what the call center industry is. So when we're talking about people with experience, we've got to make a few concessions. We've got to make some adaptations, right? We consider someone with experience that has worked, particularly in sales, right? We want to make sure they've been on the phone, but not in a tech support or just customer support role. We want to make sure they've actually done some sales. That's, we're willing to, to concede that because that is very relevant experience. That's what experience means. Re sales, whether it's uh, uh, in-home sales, selling folks to the homeowners, something to the homeowners, insurance. I love seeing folks with insurance on their resume because this is a very relevant uh, uh, industry. I love seeing, <laughs> I got a little bit of a Zoom bombing going hey. on. Hey, say hi. That's little Gustavo right there. Say hi. What's up, little Gustavo? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, anyway, so so insurance is great. Solar is actually really great, right? Because you're talking to a lot of homeowners. Um, they they own property. They want to improve their property. So solar, I love seeing that. All of these different industries that are related in a way to real estate, related in a way to real estate, we count as experience, right? If you've been doing those roles before, then yeah, definitely this can be really really relevant to you. Solar tends to be prospecting, cold calling intensive, right? So that is a very kind of a different beast, but again, very tough to do. So mad respect for people who do solar and are successful in solar. Insurance tends to be more inbound leads. People are on the web, they get inbound leads and they're calling them, trying to get them on the phone, trying to get them to book an appointment and show up at the office. Does that sound familiar? It should, because that's exactly what we do every day in real estate, right? So, so we use, we kind of expand the experience definition to count all those different roles. So, okay, instead of looking for a real estate person, needle in a haystack, right? Now you're looking for people that have been in the sales side of things on the call center and worked in different industries. Now you're looking at a much bigger pool of potential candidates, right? That's the first thing you kind of, kind of got to figure out. You got to understand. That is important. Here's the other thing, folks. I also want people to understand there's, there's a trade-off with experience. There's a trade-off with experience. And I've talked about this at another webinar. You should look it up. You know, uh, uh, the, the experience versus, you know, uh, uh, folks that are brand new in the industry. Was that, a a webinar, that. was that a webinar that you did with us or no? Yeah, with Yankee. Yeah, this, this was a few okay. weeks ago. Yeah. Jake, Definitely. can you see if you can pull that one up on YouTube and throw it into the links when you yeah, get a chance? Yeah, Exper experience versus skill, right? But it's a, it's a, it was a really good discussion. I go in depth. We went deep on that conversation on experience. But to really summarize things for you guys, you can check out that webinar if you want the, the full on uh, discussion. But in summary, there's a trade-off when you get people with experience, right? Because you're not sure it's going to be the wrong experience. That's kind of the bottom line, right? You've got to understand their skill set. You've got to understand if they're a cultural fit. Those things still matter, even with a quote-unquote experienced candidate. Really, really important to have someone. And this is common in real estate. Guys, why do teams mostly start out with new agents? They bring on new buyer agents to bring on new people because the folks that are doing it solo that are more experienced, they might not buy into the team model. It's harder to get them to buy into the team model. It might be harder to get them uh, uh, to, to jump in and take on that role. That's why most real estate teams hire people that are new to the industry. Most real estate teams do that. Yes, some people do prefer more experienced candidates. They have their great reasons for that. A lot of people prefer to get someone fresh because they're gonna learn real estate the way you do real estate. So there are some advantages to having someone that's brand new and fresh. And I, I do wanna set that as a caveat. Well, just because Gus, someone's experienced doesn't mean they're a good fit. Gus, I think also what, what I've noticed over the years is that when I was a newer, younger team, more or less experienced, right? And Jake, Jake remembers because Jake's been with me for a long time. When we had a lot less experience, a lot, uh, a lot less recognition, if we were to bring in somebody with a lot more experience, they, it would just not, it wouldn't be a fit because they have a completely different vision, right? But now we fit everyone's vision. I don't care who you are, right? Exactly. But, but it your, takes your a, vision has gotten wow. big enough. It takes a while to be able to bring in some seriously experienced people, right? 
So exactly. As you grow, I agree with you, Gus. When you're growing, you know it, it's good to bring in the newer people because they're going to be they're going to be figuring it out with you, even though you're a little bit higher along that ladder of experience. They're still going to rely on your your experience. And if you bring in somebody that's like up here, it's like what are they what are they coming in for most of the time, right? Yeah, what, exactly. I. I I love this example, Tristan. When you're a startup, because that's the example of a small business. If you're a startup mode, it's going to be hard to attract the CFO of Walmart to come and work for you, right? Yeah. They might take the job, but they're going to want to turn you into Walmart when you're a small company. You're not Walmart yet. You're not there. You're scrappy. That's a huge advantage to have. I don't think it's a bad thing, but there's going to be a time when your vision and your business is big enough to bring in CFOs from Fortune 500 companies. So that's yeah. what you need. You're, you're aspired to be a Fortune 500 company at that point. I mean, that's really, really important to understand. So that's the, that's what I mean about that trade-off on the, about experience. Understand right. what experience can mean, and cultural fit and skill set is still going to, in my opinion, is still going to trump everything, right? Cultural fit and skill set is going to be the game. And the best way to, to judge someone's cultural fit, their values, and their skill set, I have not yet found an interview process that evaluates that effectively. I haven't found it. I, I find that out really by having them be in the job, which is why we always have a probationary period in all of the positions in the company, right? Typically it's gonna be three months. It can be less depending on the role, but typically we put people on probation. We wanna find out, they, we know they have a skill set. We know they have, we like them. They have a, they have a, a good personality. They, we think they can be a good teammate, uh, but we wanna find out that for sure. So I have a question then. I have a question for you because I, I know that you run Power ISA, which is just uh, a group of people calling for us, right? Real estate agents using our database, calling whoever they want, uh, whoever we want for. Why do you pick Mexico then to bring them all from? Why? Why? How did you end up grabbing them all from Mexico? Yeah, well, there, there's two reasons. The, the the first one, the most important one, is I'm from Mexico, so I think I, I have a, I have, a <laughs> I, have, I have an unfair advantage. That's funny. Uh, that I'm from here, right? So that's that's okay. one reason. That's pretty. I'm pretty. I'm not going to say that's not an important reason. It's a pretty important reason. Yeah. Uh, the second one is that uh, candidates from Mexico have a lot of advantages. They're on the same time zone as folks uh, uh, in the U.S. We cover basically from Pacific all the way to Eastern. We have those time zones in Mexico, right, throughout the year, even mountain time. I discovered this by we're doing this job. We have mountain time time zone. You're muted. You got yeah, muted. There it is. There it is. Oh, did I? Oh. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. You got it. Okay, great. Yeah. So, so we got the time zone advantage, and then mostly we have a lot. We're really unique in the whole world, where a lot of folks in Mexico have lived, worked, and grown up in the U.S., and they're now living in Mexico. And that goes from folks like Dreamer kids, folks that got repatriated, True. retirees. We've got U.S. citizens that have family that come to live in Mexico. We have all these different groups, and that is a unique situation across the whole planet. Very rare to have that many people in one single place um, where you have a true bicultural set of folks, right? They're, they move within the, the Mexican and the Spanish language culture as easily as they do in the U.S. And the, and the English language culture. It's really rare to have that, and I've never seen a higher concentration of folks like that than in Mexico. Maybe Canada, but that's kind of unfair. They also speak English in Canada. It's kind of weird, right? The bike, the truly bicultural piece I've seen in Mexico is pretty unique. All right. I, I agree with you because our ISA with you that we use from Power ISA is from Mexico. And when we first started working together three years ago, or a little, it was about three years ago-ish. Yep. Roughly, so roughly. I was looking specifically for one of my agents and Jake who's in the background, who makes everything happen. Thanks, Jake. He, he knows that uh, Luis, who, who this ISA is for, is very particular, right? <laughs> Luis, tough customer. We, good, good agent, tough customer. <laughs> yeah, he's, a very, he's an amazing agent, but he's very particular. And <laughs> he's also one of, our, one of our best agents. He closes a lot of multi-million dollar deals. And I'm going to mute you really quick so I can tell the story. But he, he covers Malibu, he covers Calabasas, Beverly Hills, Pacific Palisades, all high end. And he was really worried about bringing in an ISA to work his database. And so, and rightfully so, right? Because the experience matters. So when we first got in with Gus, we told him, hey, this is what we're looking for. 
And he put us in with somebody that was absolutely great. See, the cool thing about what, what Gus isn't telling you is that he, he focuses, and you should too, on character. He's focusing on character. Do they fit the culture, right? Because if they fit his culture, which you can see, Gus is pretty easygoing. But he also has, he also has these standards that, that his people need to abide by, right? He's easygoing, but great standards. And that happens to cross over to the people that, that in this case, he's working with me. He's working with our team. And so when we hired this guy, he not only would follow up correctly, he, he knew what to say. The training matters, right? Like Luis feels so comfortable working with, with at the time it was Carlos Gustavo, but I know we just switched. But yep. he felt so incredibly comfortable knowing that Carlos was the one reaching out, right? Because he understood the culture we're in. He understood, like you said, his English is great, right? So yeah, that to absolutely. us was really, really important for us. And yeah, I, I think it is. And I, and I appreciate the, the kind words there, Tristan. Yeah, I, I think it's really important, right? You know, uh, a cultural fit, a personality fit. And also, this is really important. We have to fit the right person to the right campaign. You cannot put a cold calling kind of hard-nosed profile with an agent like Greece, right? Like that, that's just not the profile. That's not the project we're trying to do, right? That's not the level of service he's providing, not the lead source we're calling. So it's, I think mean, matching all those things, um, it's, it's not easy, but that's where you get those really great results, right? When you've got the right person, right campaign, uh, uh, you, you match that skill set, uh, then then like the match happens 100%. So yeah, 100%. So so, so get, it, get it back to it. So, okay, uh, experience I say, that's great. That's awesome. Well, another thing, this is another caveat, right? I, I mentioned the trade-off caveat, that's one. Here's another caveat, because I get this question a lot. Gus, I need an experienced ISA because I don't have any time to train them. That's why I need an experienced ISA. And I, and I go, okay, red flag, a couple of red flags are already happening, right? So even if when we've got someone, you know, uh, working with Power ISA, Power ISA has recruited them, trained them, and got them ready, they have not worked with Luis. They have not worked with Tristan yet. They need to understand how Tristan works. They need to understand how Luis works because yeah, you, you don't work like every other agent out there, right? You've developed a process, a system that that ISA is going to plug into. So this, the, even if you're getting someone, you know, that has been with Power ISA for five years, the, the thought of, oh, I don't want to train them. I don't have time to train them. Someone has to show them what the Tristan process is. And we're not that person, right? So I always tell folks, uh, don't let experience be like a, like a, a, a proxy for, I don't need to train this person at all. That's not true, actually, right? That, that can be tricky and don't fall into that trap. The amount of time, yes, you're gonna dedicate time to someone, especially at the beginning, the first couple of weeks, but that time is worth $10,000 an hour. To you. You're investing in that time to get the right person to understand, to do things the right way, uh, to really leverage your business and grow the business. That is time invested in growing your business. You're working on the business. You're not working in the business. I think it's unbelievably important to understand that. So that, so all those things being said, what experience means, what it doesn't mean. Okay, that's I hope we've gotten the, the the definitions and the important points out of the way. Well, okay, Greg, awesome. How can we find uh, those those experienced ISAs? Number one thing, the one one thing you have to talk about is you have to have a compelling offer. So it has to be a really relevant, really important, really attractive offer for them to join your team. Because guess what? Experienced ISAs are employed. They are talent. They're working somewhere. You essentially have to steal them away from another company, another industry, and attract them into real estate and into your team. You have to craft an attractive offer. And it has to include salary. It has to have a bonuses on top of that. You have to include little perks like paid time off. You all, there's all these things you can stack up on that offer. But I really get concerned when I see people try to, trying to recruit ISAs uh, and they want them to be commission only, like, like typical real estate salespeople. That's normal, right? That's normal for our industry. It's not normal for the ISA role. Typically, ISA role is a salaried position. So understand that your offer matters, right? And so, so definitely put that, take that into consideration because if you want an experienced ISA, you got to bring them over uh, from another job to be interested in your position. And that's really, really key. Dude, that's that's it. I think the the challenge is though, how do we create the value, right? Or how do we how do we accelerate the value? And I don't know that a lot of people have 
have the time to be able to focus on that value to attract the right ISAs, right? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And I see folks uh, struggle with that. I had a client that was in my in my coaching program, kind of struggling with this. They can't, actually got to work with me because we're saying, "Hey, Gus, nobody wants to work." Uh, you know, people come in and they leave, you know, it's like he's really frustrated with the, with, the, with the hiring and training process. And for me, that's like, okay, there's a value problem here now, right? This is because they were doing the right, they were attracting a bunch of people. They had solid systems for them to plug into, but the value as a team, the whole, the whole thing wasn't there, right? And for me, that's a red flag. People don't want to work. Hmm, in my experience, that's not true, right? So people want to work, but they might not want to work for you, right? So that's a little bit of a different, it's a difficult question to ask, but you should ask that question and always be curious. I approach these things strictly with curiosity. If I'm, ha- if I'm having an issue attracting talented people to my team, the, va- the offer's not great. The value proposition is not there. You're gonna strengthen that. Let me give you a few really, really important examples. When, when you've got people at- attracting them to your team as an ISA for, for that ISA role, Make sure your salary is competitive. And I have another video where we talk about this in a little bit more in depth about hiring. Maybe take a look at that video, the hiring, the ISA uh, video that we've done for LTA. I go in depth into that. You've got to be, you don't have to be, you don't have to pay the most. You don't have to pay the most. I don't pay the most, but you have to be competitive. You have to know what the high end is for your range, what the low end is for your range, and put yourself comfortably in the middle. So you have a little bit of wiggle room in either, in either direction, right? You gotta be you gotta be competitive for the marketplace. Understand what your marketplace is offering. If you're hiring virtually, right? Great. Uh, uh, folks in the Philippines, you can find folks in the Philippines for two dollars an hour. Definitely, you can. Understand that's the low end of the market, right? Because other folks in the Philippines are going to charge four, five, six, seven, eight dollars an hour. Okay, that's the high end of the market. Where do you want to be, right? That's another thing that's important. So every market's a little bit different. You've got to have at least a competitive compensation, competitive compensation, because all those, all things being equal, then they go, okay, well, who's Tristan then? He's got this offer, looks interesting to me, attractive to me, looks competitive. Okay, well, then what does Tristan bring to the table? And that's where you really, that's where the intangible comes in. You've got to sell them on the vision of this team. Why is the Tristan team, right? Tristan and company, why is that an attractive place to work at? Why? Is this a dead-end job? Is this an entry-level job that no one wants to stay in? Or, or, or is this part of a bigger plan? Is this part of a bigger team that's going to accomplish something awesome, right? Those things play into it. And they play into it a lot more than people think sometimes, Tristan, because they know they have issues with attention. They've got issues, issues even attracting talented candidates, experienced candidates. Like you said earlier, right? You've got to show that your vision is big enough to get really good people in there. So the offer, the vision, the value proposition for the team, I think it's one of the biggest things people struggle with. And, and, they, and they question, why am I not attracting uh, uh, experienced candidates? I only attract people that have no other alternative, right? I remember we had, we had a joke at night, when I worked at Microsoft, people didn't know my top, I have a software background. You would joke, Sometimes that you know, hey, why'd you end up working at Microsoft? Because Pizza Hut wouldn't take me, right? That was a joke the, the vice president would throw out there. And they go, well, the 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 point is, sometimes you know, you joke, this is the worst place to work. Because even the 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 worst you know, uh, uh, entry level position wouldn't take you, right? So don't be that place that you're. The only reason you're hiring entry level people is because you can't aspire to more. That's that's the wrong approach to have. That's the wrong vision to have for the company. Yes, you can get an entry level person. But you want the best entry level people. The, even in that range, even in, even if you're Pizza Hut, you want to find a way to, to get the highest level, the best, the most uh, professional, the most uh, talented entry level people. Even in that group of folks, you want the best. So you've really got to think about your offer. Has to be competitive compensation, regardless of which market you're hiring in, and you've really got to sell them on the vision of the team. ISA role. Are you going to need an ISA manager at some point? Do you want them to become a salesperson? Can they become a closer on your team? Can they move into marketing? A lateral move. A lot of our folks move into staff positions. I really tell that ISA that want to grow. I've got to figure out another place to put them. They don't want to always be on the phone, right? So you've got to have some vision for people to grow. And if they just want, and they're, and they're motivated by the compensation, by money, have a plan for them to make more money, right? You've got to have an avenue of growth unbelievably important. A brand new person might overlook these things when they're looking for a position. 
An experienced person will not overlook these things. They're going to look for overall value, the whole package, right? That's what they're going to want to see. So really, really focus on that when you're getting started. All right. So then once that's in place, how do we continue to be able to cater to the experienced ISAs? Like, what is the what does the training look like to keep them growing? Oh, excellent, excellent question. So one of the things that the more experienced ISAs, um, one, of the, one of the issues they can have is they feel they might already know everything. Oh, they don't want to go on a deal set. You've got to challenge them, right? You've got to show them things that they don't know. And you might not be the best person to do that. Look for LCA is a great uh, 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 you know, resource. Look at my videos here in the, on the LCA channel. We're talking about more. Some of our uh, uh, talks are more advanced for ISAs or salespeople. Some of them are, are entry-level 101 type topics. Look for those topics. It can be a video. Show them, hey, check out this video and let's discuss. Don't just throw content on the wall and ignore it, guys. Show them content and then talk to them about it, right? Say, hey, how is this you? How can this be useful to you, right? We, we, we had, you know, Vision 2022. Yeah, that, you, you can invite them to those events. Hey, check out because that event you guys had earlier in the week, um, you know, it was about, hey, how do you use psychology? How do you use user behavior? How do you build experiences that are great for people? That is a, an advanced topic. That might not be an entry-level topic for a, a newbie, new ISA. Hey, you can present them with content that is appropriate to their level, right? It's appropriate to where they want to be and where they want to grow. You've got to be looking. You as a leader, Tristan, that's your job, is to look for those opportunities to get them more challenging content. But what, not the 101, the 201, the 301, different topics, right? Unbelievably important. And I think it's a great time to mention, right? Great segue to mention that Power ISA, for the first time now this year, we're actually offering training for existing ISAs. Not the people that we hired and trained and managed, but if you're struggling to find content, struggling to make time to train and manage group coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching for your ISA, definitely reach out. We have all the same kind of special deals that we have for our other services. Apply to this new service. Check out the link that goes our landing page below. Uh, check it out. But if you have an ISA on your team, you're struggling to keep them challenged, to keep them updated, to keep them up to date, and just make sure that, that someone is giving them the right direction, check us out, check out the offerings that we have. We are another option out there to keep your ISA trained and challenged because the experienced person, they want to be changed. That's true. That's true. You know, I heard, a, I heard a quote today and then I put it on my Instagram, which you may have already seen it or not. Um, and it was, your comfort will betray you. And, and the more I thought of it, I'm like, damn, that was, that was, and I heard it in passing in a, in a, in an interview like this. And the more I thought about that, it's like, we get so comfortable doing the things that we normally do. And then we don't grow. And then we were like, why am I not growing? Right. And that's because we get super comfortable. And this is where, this is where, I, this is why I love this because if I had an ISA group of people that I could put into it because I hired mine through you. So it's different, right? I don't have mine in house. We outsource it because <laughs> I don't want the headache, but I know some of you love that headache. And, and this is why it's cool to have both of these things, right? The training from you for those that have the ISAs and also the ISAs. And so whichever route you take, just, uh, Make sure you use Power ISA, man. So I love doing these with you, Gus. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. And, you know, that, that is, you know, what, one of the biggest obstacles is just kind of understanding that that's your role as the leader, right? Providing those opportunities, uh, you know, making sure you're providing that, that those chances to really level up, right? The next thing I want to talk about, Tristan, okay, great. You've got that offer. You've got that value prop. You understand the challenge of attracting and retaining uh, uh, experienced people. Okay, well, okay, great, Gus. I got it understood my value prop is I've leveled it up my offer I've leveled it up okay well then not now what right where, where can you find some of these experienced quote-unquote experienced folks then okay great I love that topic because that's a really really common question I get as well um that you can find them they're all over the place once you know where to look but one of the main places to look people overlook is Facebook folks there are so believe me not there are Facebook groups 
pool of folks working in call centers, former call center employees. That is the pool of talent we love to tap into. Facebook groups, call center workers, former call center workers, people working in sales, people working in telemarketing. Folks, these groups are everywhere. They're in every country. Obviously, countries like Philippines, like Mexico, that have a massive call center industries are going to have more of these groups, bigger of these groups. That's, that's true. But you can also find them in the U.S. as well, right? So definitely, that is a great resource. A lot of them welcome people posting job opportunities in some of those groups. Some of them have some rules around that. Just figure it out. Be compliant. Understand the rules. Um, and you're going to do great. Some of these groups are specifically for job opportunities, right? I'm talking about Philippines and Mexico. They have entire 10,000 person groups that you're supposed to drop job opportunities in there for folks who contact you. Those are great ways to find it. That's number one. Number two, folks, good old, you know, ZipRecruiter, Indeed.com, those work, right? Those are, and they work for a reason. A lot of folks that are more uh, experienced, that's where they look for new opportunities. They want to work for a more established company and they kind of perceive Indeed.com, especially Indeed. Indeed is huge all over the world. Um, they, they perceive Indeed as being a place to find more formal employment, more serious entrepreneurs, right? That's where you look at that. So that's a great resource to find uh, experienced candidates. It, there has a cost, right? It costs, obviously it costs more than going into a Facebook group. Uh, but again, this depends how many folks you need to hire and what level of candidate you're looking. The Indeed candidate is going to send you a full-on resume. Like that, that, they even have to upload that to get on the site. So you're going to have a little bit of a different experience. Yes, it costs more, but guess what? You have to invest to get a really good person on your team, right? That's another rich resource. Another one that you can use, another one you can use is Facebook ads, folks, right? Facebook ads. The way they work for real estate, well, guess what? They can work for folks that are looking for new opportunities, right? You can just publish. And again, this also falls, the same as real estate, it falls under the special ads category. Google it, figure that out. It's pretty straightforward. You can publish an opportunity. Hey, I'm looking for someone for my real estate team, inside sales agent, telemarketing experience preferred, right? Put it out there. You're looking for people that are experienced that have done call center work in sales, telemarketing, telesales, telephone based sales. You want people with that experience. That is an automatic filter, folks. You can put it in there. I want someone who's done this one to two years, one to three years. It really is hard to find people with more than that. So I would say the, the probably three years is enough. Uh, one to three years of previous experience selling over the phone. Unbelievably important. Another term people use is appointment setter. Appointment setting experience for previous. Yes, Rebecca's oh, got go a great it. question for you. Uh, yeah. Do your ISAs at Power ISA work with KV Core, the CRM? Oh, really, really good question. So our ISAs are trained on using real estate CRM. We don't use KV Core in our training sessions. We mostly use Follow Up Boss and Chime, but we try to teach them in an agnostic way. Teach them how saved searches work, how tagging and assignments work. So, and that most of those skills are transferable basically to any CRM. So we they have the basics down. But yes, when someone you get someone from our team or even someone else, someone higher on your own, you do have to show them the ins and outs of your CRM. Even if you're using follow-up box or chime, I don't know if you've seen that some, somebody else's, you know, follow-up box and chime installation. It can be different, guys. Some people, amazingly, don't use tags at all in follow-up box. I don't know how they do it. They don't use tags. They just use statuses, custom field and a status, and they're done, right? That's it, right? So how you've implemented follow-up box can be different from somebody else. So there's a training that has to happen the first 30 days on getting them used to how you use that CRM. So the folks at Power ISA do not come like pre-installed with the KD Core training, uh, but they come trained on CRM and how to use a CRM. They are going to need uh, a walkthrough of how you use your CRM. Hopefully that, that answers the question. It does, man. And I think one thing that I have a question on is, let's say they aren't experienced with KV Core. Do can, can I bring them on and say, hey, this is these are the tutorials on KV Core. Watch it. Hundred uh, percent. Uh, that's, that's a great example. That's what most of the teams do. They go, okay, great. That's part of the first week of, uh, of joining the team. Looking at the collateral. If your team has collateral, that's great. But at the very least, the dialers have collateral. The CRMs have collateral, right? All of the tools that you use tend to have some kind of a, a help documents, video tutorials, 
have to go through that, right? A uh, great point, Tristan. You don't have to sit with them eight hours a day showing them every single feature of the CRM. That's absolutely correct. They can be dive, take the deep dive into the CRM. They can reach out to questions to their, our, our own team. They can ask their supervisor, our IT team. And if, some, if there's something specific to your business, they're going to go and ask you. But they should go to you with questions. Like, hey, how does this work? How does that work? How's this specific process? It shouldn't be like a blank stare and just show me everything. That's the wrong way to approach it. You're right. <laughs> That's not the way. That's if you want to fail, Gus. I just put exactly. up the link for, for powerisa.com forward slash LCA. Take a look at it. There's the offer. Gus, thanks for being on, buddy. I appreciate it. Even from Mexico, you showed up. Yeah, 100%. Wouldn't miss it. It's, uh, it's still the su- nice and sunny, 70 degrees outside. I don't mind it. What time is it right now where you're at? It is 3.38. Oh, you're two hours ahead of me. Nice. Yeah, there you go. You're central. You're central. Central. Central town. You got it. I love it. Thanks, guys. Everyone, go visit Power ISA. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching.